So I'll read your bio real quick and then we'll uh, get started. Logan Campbell sure. is the founder and CEO of Aerotoss, which provides human in the loop drone data processing for surveyors. He founded Aerotoss in 2014. Happy 10 year anniversary, I'm sure at some point coming up. I know, coming up real soon. Not till like October, but yeah, 10 years. All right. I love it. Makes it ancient in the uh, in the drone world, at least. Yeah, right. No kidding. I can remember kind of when you first started. Uh, has helped thousands of servers get the highest quality data out of their drone programs. Prior to founding Aerotoss, Logan worked as a statistician in the financial services industry. Logan is a certified mapping scientist with the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing and holds an MBA from uh, Harvard Business School. As recognized industry expert, he regularly speaks at survey and drone conferences and writes numerous land surveying publications. So we had Logan on at the very beginning. Uh, I just went back and looked week seven and we're up to week 132 tonight. So uh, three and a half years later, uh, I'm sure things have changed quite dramatically. And so uh, not quite 10 years, but you're on your way. That's for sure. Right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. No, it's fun. Things, so. things have definitely changed a lot over the last three years. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. So this will be uh, the the last one we did was drone uh, drone surveys 101. So uh, definitely a lot more informative tonight. So I appreciate your time always uh, jumping on and everything you do for the survey industry as a whole with uh, your presentations and stuff you do at the conferences. So that's always awesome as well. So Great to see you there uh, at the last couple of conferences. So thanks for yeah. thanks for your time, and I uh, appreciate it. And we'll we'll get started drone survey accuracy and how to prove it. Um, and we'll kind of again always informative, open uh, open dialogues, conversations. Throw it in the chat or raise your hand. So Logan will yes, please. I do love the chat. I love uh, anyone that wants to raise their hand virtually or otherwise, or just scream with your microphone off. That works because. Yeah, I mean, Trent knows me. I like to answer answer questions, make a conversation, because that's why I'm here is to actually help answer yeah. questions and and share a lot of the knowledge that we've put together over the past. Yeah, exactly. Years. So, I love it. Thank you, sir. Cool. I'll turn it over. So yeah, I mean, for the next uh, hour and change or so, we're going to be talking about drone survey accuracy. Uh, yeah, if, the, if my first talk was drone 101, this is more like drones 305. Uh, specifically, getting a lot more in depth into the actual accuracy of drones. And my goal with the next uh, hour or so is to give you enough information to understand exactly what drone surveying accuracy is. Because a lot of people have very different definitions of accuracy, and that's okay. There have been different definitions of accuracy over the years. And if anything else, I'll let you know what many of the different ones are so that when someone says accuracy, you kind of know what they're talking about. We're also going to talk about at least what the state of the art is today about how to create and interpret accuracy statements so that you can state and certify the accuracy of a, of a drone or any aerial survey for that matter, if you so choose. We're also then, we're going to start on the more kind of academic side of things and then get over the course of the hour more and more practical as we get to then all of the things that uh, impact accuracy as well what different types of cameras and drone technology or field operations and flight operations can impact accuracy. And most of all, let you guys know where to go when you need more information, uh, because this is only an hour overview. I mean, between all of the statistics and accuracy, I mean, it, I, I could spend three hours just reading some of the documentation that goes into a lot of this stuff. But instead, I'm going to show you a lot of places where you can learn more as well, all of the various resources that are out there. Trent gave a really great uh, intro as well, but a little bit just more about background about Aerotoss, my company. We do drone data processing for surveyors, have for coming up on 10 years now. And that gives us a pretty unique perspective on this, too, because we've actually seen uh, the drone data from thousands of surveyors across the country send us their data. So we actually get to see all of the many, many different ways that people screw things up, which is a pretty <laughs> unique thing to do. And that also lets us see the different ways that are uh, that actually work. So all of this, I mean, everything I'm about to say comes from a perspective of the real world, actual real world surveying, not ivory tower academia. And that's the source of it. We actually get to see this data and apply it to the real world. As was mentioned, uh, I come from a background of finance and statistics, and statistics led me into photogrammetry through all sorts of crazy weird career paths. But long story short, 
I'm a numbers guy. I love the statistical analysis. This is the stuff where my actual formal academic background is too. So we're going to be talking about the statistics of accuracy and how it goes, uh, goes in there as well. And putting it all together, why we're even talking about this, my, why we're talking about accuracy and accuracy statements, my goal here, I mean, Trent does a huge amount of work with the uh, industry as well. And my goal here is to help you guys build a drone program that does three things. It should save you time, it should cost less money, and it should improve deliverables. Again, I'm not an ivory tower academic guy. I'm a businessman. I want to view this as something that you can actually use day to day. I don't like research projects. Well, that's not entirely true. I do like research projects. I love early, I'm, I'm an early adopter tech guy, and I spend... I spend money on researching stuff and new technology and that sort of things. And that's how you lose money. But for the sake of this presentation, we're going to focus on business, which means actually using your drone equipment, making sure that you don't just know what accuracy is, but talk about the different ways you can actually use it in the real world to get a better overall drone program. And I think if your drone program is new in all of these three things, then it's not working too well. As far as some of the topics that we're going to that I'm going to cover that I have uh, throughout this presentation, first off, we're going to talk about what is accuracy. When I say a drone survey is accurate to a tenth of a foot, what the heck does that mean? Does that mean that every point is within a tenth of a foot? Within a tenth of a foot of what? How do you measure it on the ground? Is it a 95% confident it's interval? Is it 90% of shots are within a tenth of a foot? Does it make you, can you do half foot contours? We're going to go through all about that. We're also going to go about how to measure accuracy, how to certify and report accuracy as well, reporting accuracy for drone surveyors, and then what impacts accuracy and how to prove it. So again, you can see this is that whole, we're going to start with the much more academic side, statistical mathematical definitions of accuracy, go through measuring it, certifying it, and then getting a more accurate project as we get more and more in the real world as we continue to go. It's worth noting there are a couple of things that I'm not going to cover here. Um, this isn't that important, but things like large format stereo photogrammetry, if you're used to using, you know, 12 inch photogrammic, uh, photogrammetric negative plates in a Kelsch plotter, that's a totally different ball game. It's cool, not what we're talking about. Same thing with large scale manned aircraft, LIDAR. While it shares a lot of principles, if you're talking about measuring the accuracy of your county's LIDAR data where an entire county or an entire state was flown with LIDAR, that's different. Same thing with satellites or synthetic aperture radar, stuff like that. I find that stuff to be absolutely fascinating and cool, but a little bit out of scope. We're going to be focusing much more on drone-based photogrammetry and drone-based LIDAR for land surveying. But I also like to start, I don't like burying the lead in my presentations. How accurate are drone surveys? How do you prove it? I'll start with the answers and then get into all of the uh, information that backs it up. So how accurate are they? Short answer is they're as accurate as you need. You can get up to a centimeter worth of accuracy on a drone survey, but that is extremely rare and expensive. Now, there are a lot of mis uh, misunderstandings here when it comes to drone surveying because a lot of people have either used a drone or gotten data that was taken from a drone and said, it's off by two feet. So clearly drone surveys are not accurate. And I'm sure that was the case. There are a lot of drone surveys out there that are inaccurate. In fact, there are lots of ways that you can get bad accuracy out of the drone, but I should point out, it isn't all that hard to get good accuracy. The biggest limitations with all of this though, are time and money. Like I said, you can get centimeter accuracy, if you want to spend half a million dollars on the drone and equipment that it takes to get there, which is part of why centimeter grade drone survey accuracy is extremely rare. So in the real world, most surveys target a tenth of a foot. And I will be getting into exactly what I mean by a tenth of a foot accuracy, but as a good rule of thumb, and believe it or not, I didn't pull that tenth of a foot number out of thin air. There's an awful lot of science that actually backs up exactly why I say a tenth of a foot. But a tenth of a foot is kind of the magic number for how you target, uh, for what you should target in terms of drone survey accuracy. As far as how do you measure and certify it? Well, it's actually pretty simple from a very high level. Step one is you set checkpoints. You take the things that you want to measure and you measure them on the ground. So that means you might set targets like on the picture there. 
and you measure them with your GPS or your total station, then you measure the error between what you measured on the ground and what you measured with the drone, and you report the error. That's it. It's actually that simple. Now, of course, there's more data in there. How many check shots do you take? What are your procedures for checking them? Do you actually use the data that you set your check shot to to actually build the model? How many should you check? Where should they be? Like all of those things do matter. And that's what we're going to be covering more. But the basic idea is how do you measure and certify an error? Well, you measure it. You actually check the error and you measure it uh, from where to go there. And everything I'm going to be talking about, I said I I don't love ivory tower academia, but there is a academic and scientific foundation to all of this. What I'm going to be using for most of this is uh, the ASPRS. It's a nonprofit organization. I think I've been around, we've been around for a long time at 10 years, but they've been around for about 80 years, which is still kind of crazy to me that a photogrammetry and remote sensing organization has been around for 80 years. So this is where the actual kind of mathematics and statistics come from. And more specifically, a document called the ASPRS Positional Accuracy Standards for Digital Geospatial Data, addition to version one as of August of 2023, which is actually a very new document. So it's pretty darn um, pretty darn useful. And I see Trent's already sending out links. I'll, we'll see if he can find the link to this PDF and send it out. And I'm more than happy to send it out afterwards. But this is really the gold standard for measuring accuracy in an academic sense, at least. These positional accuracy standards, they are 97 pages long PDF of very highly academic stuff with really rigorous mathematical and procedural standards. Just reading through it takes a long time and actually understanding how to implement it is even harder. That's because they are pretty complicated and impractical to implement. Honestly, a lot of the things that they recommend, a lot of their best practices, nobody does in the field because they're super costly and tricky to implement. And they're difficult to interpret. So my goal is to take a lot of these best practices, the knowledge, the, the really core knowledge from this document, and try and make it as simple, useful, and practical as possible. So that means you can actually take this information, take it home to your business, and use it. So like I said, please ask questions as we get into the statistics of this stuff, while also acknowledging you're probably not going to become a certified photogrammetrist overnight. Uh, you might be a certified photogrammetrist, in which case, I guess, technically you would. But uh, there's a lot of uh, in-depth data here. So please ask questions. And uh, of course, if you ever want, you can talk to an expert. And heck, that's why you're here, is because there are a lot of people in this room where you can ask questions and uh, and we can figure out the best practices going. All right. So with that, let's actually dive straight into the uh, the meat of all of this by talking about what is accuracy. Now, as I mentioned before, there is no single definition of accuracy. Surveyors don't all agree on the same definition. And the basic concepts of accuracy are complicated because as we'll get into, accuracy is not actually a fixed number. It is a probabilistic estimation of what the likely error is. But we'll get into that because one of the things that really helps me is, uh, me understand it at least, is understanding a little bit of the history of map accuracy standards. One thing that is actually still very commonly in use among surveyors are the National Map Accuracy Standards, which were originally published in 1947 by the US Bureau of the Budget. And this is what a lot of people have heard of before, where accuracy is based on map scale and based on contour interval. And it had definitions where 90% of check shots must be measured within one half contour interval and all sorts of things like that. And if you had a map scale that was exactly, you know, this scale, then it implied an accuracy of this much. Super useful. Those were the gold standards for decades, but they were developed in an era where people didn't have computers. There were no digital maps. There was no digital mapping. People didn't have the ability to write equal standard deviation and have a computer calculate all of the tricky math for you. So things, the, the state of the art has certainly come a long way since then, even though they were really valid and they made sense. And then things moved on. They started to get more advanced in 1990. ASPRS published their first accuracy standards then. 
Uh, the um, National Standard for Spatial Data Accuracy was published by the government in 98. That's when it started switching to a more statistical methodology as opposed to the just map scale and contour intervals. So now we're talking about confidence intervals as well. And the ASPRS Positional Accuracy Standards Edition 1 came out in 2014, and a good nine years later came out uh, Edition 2. So this is, when I say accuracy, I talk about accuracy as measured according to the ASPRS Positional uh, Accuracy Standards for Geospatial Data. And when I talk about accuracy, it's worth noting that accuracy and error, which are slightly different, but I use them interchangeably for all practical purposes, they're the same thing, uh, is probabilistic. That means that when I say a tenth of a foot accuracy, I don't mean that everything's a tenth of a foot off. In fact, if it was a tenth of a foot off, I would adjust it and it would be zero error, which isn't the case. Accuracy and error is an estimate of the likely statistical error of one point relative to an unknowable truth. We don't know actually what the truth is. We do our best to estimate it. We might use ground-based GPS or a total station, or we'll mark a point and call it 5,000, 5,000, and that is the truth. But we don't actually know. Every error has estimates, and these all go together and create this standard normal deviation. This idea of a standard normal deviation that, yes, you want as many points close to that middle zero error, but you have a few points that might be a hundredth of a foot too high, a few points that are a hundredth of a foot too low. And if everything is done right, you have the same approximate number of points that are slightly too high or slightly too low. I'll pause for a second and make sure that there are any, see if there are any questions, because I know statistics and standard deviations and standard normal curves can obviously get a little bit tricky here. <laughs> we could do a whole class on that. Well, oh, yeah, we could. <laughs> and just wait, because it gets even more complicated. <laughs> <I love> it. <laughs> as much as I love the standard normal distribution where you have errors are always the same, this idea of kind of probabilistic error, in the real world, not all error is normally distributed. You have something that is often called a uh, skew, where this is the way that I like to imagine it here. If you have hardscape, you measure it and call it exactly uh, 100 feet, you are equally likely to have your drone measurement say 100.1 feet or 99.9 .9 feet. That's a normal distribution and that's what's common on hardscape. But in vegetation, if you have a foot worth of grass and you're trying to measure the true ground underneath that grass, sometimes, and if the true ground's 100 feet, sometimes you'll hit it right on the nose at 100 feet, Sometimes it'll measure the top of the grass by accident and it'll say 101 feet, but it's never going to be a foot too low. You're never going to get 99 feet. So you have this idea with skew, and this is common in vegetation where things are skewed high, that you have a lot of points that are higher than the ground actually is, but very few and basically no points that are lower than the ground is. That's really common in LIDAR with vegetated areas too. And it's not even a bad thing. It's because this is just more of an acknowledgement. This is the way of the world. There's error in the world. You're not going to get rid of all sources of error in the world, whether it's statistical error, noise from vibrations or from temperature or the issues looking through the air, the issues of GPS propagating through the troposphere. All of that causes error. Our goal is to just estimate it and measure it as best we can. Uh, as part of it, there are also concepts of accuracy versus precision. As a general rule of thumb, accuracy means how close something is to the real point on the planet, and precision is relative accuracy, how things, how close things are to one another. A way that I like to, to point out is that if you use a total station set up over an arbitrary point, like set it up over 5,000, 5,000, that's super precise because everything is, at, is really tight relative to that arbitrary point you set up, but it's not that accurate because it doesn't know where on the planet it is. So at least in drone surveys, the way you can get different things as a general rule of thumb, using any sort of onboard RTK or PPK will get you very precise data when you're doing an aerial survey. But for accurate data, you need to use things like ground control points, programming your base station over, over a known point, or getting an opus solution on your base station and correcting everything relative to there. So there's your basic accuracy versus precision uh, 
thing as well. But going forward, we're going to be talking mostly about accuracy with this because that's uh, they, although the the concepts can be applied to both accuracy and precision. So now to take it one more step further, what is that gold standard for accuracy nowadays? With It used to be that kind of half contour interval. According to the ASPRS positional accuracy standards, and this is where, again, the, the academic gold standard for aerial surveyors is something called the root mean squared error. It is very, very, very similar in concept to a standard deviation. And basically, the root mean squared error is the error, the, uh, sum of squares difference between what the drone measured and the independent check shot. You take the independent check shots and the drone measurement and you calculate effectively the standard deviation, again, technically a root mean squared error difference between the two of those, and that's your error. So actually, when I say a survey should have an accuracy of a tenth of a foot, what I actually am meaning, the more ex expanded version is the root mean squared error of independent check shots relative to the map as measured according to the ASPRS positional accuracy standards should be less than a tenth of a foot. I just don't say that because, boy, that is a mouthful and no one would understand it. But that is typically when you say tenth, or at least when I say tenth of a foot accuracy, that's what it really means. The root mean squared error of independent check shots is less than a tenth of a foot. That's what it should be. Now, again, that's a statistical measure. Does it mean that every single check shot, or if you took a thousand measurement points, that they're all going to be less than a tenth of a foot? Not necessarily, because it's statistics. It's probabilistic. There is a chance that it is above that. That is very, very normal. So that's the idea of root mean squared error. That is, uh, that is con the concept. But to even continue making it more complicated, accuracy has multiple dimensions, too. When I say root mean squared error of independent check shots, I didn't uh, specify whether it was horizontal or vertical or both. Um, and the idea behind that is that horizontal and vertical accuracy are oftentimes different, and that's actually okay. For example, when you're mapping with a photogrammetry drone, typically your horizontal accuracy, because of the nature of photogrammetry, horizontal accuracy is going to be pretty darn tight and the vertical vertical accuracy is not quite as good. Sometimes it's very, very close, but not quite as good as horizontal. And LIDAR data is often the other way around. The vertical data is really good on LIDAR, but the horizontal data, because it can't pick up things like paint striping or sharp horizontal features, at least not aerial LIDAR, is a little bit worse. So just being aware that accuracy can be different in different dimensions uh, can definitely go a long way. And likewise, accuracy can be different between non-vegetated and vegetated uh, data as well. So um, your accuracy on hardscape is almost always going to be better than your accuracy in vegetated areas. So if you were following the strictest version of the standards, you would actually report two versions of accuracy. A non-vegetated accuracy, that's for hardscape, and a vegetated accuracy for areas with a lot of vegetation. And again, the idea of vegetated accuracy is less. Should be no worth noted, that's typically only for LIDAR is where you use vegetated accuracy because in photogrammetry, you can't see through trees. So there is no actual measurement there. You only have the one uh, level of accuracy for photogrammetry, but with LIDAR mapping, you also have this concept of vegetated vertical accuracy. And another thing just to be aware of, this isn't even, uh, Ca captured in the standards that well, but just be aware that accuracy can be different across sites. If you have a whole bunch of control, ground control points set in one side of the site and nothing set on the other, that other side might be less accurate. Or in a site like this where you have, uh, you have a parking lot with hardscape, it might be super accurate. And then you might have the woods here where you have LIDAR data and looking through the woods is actually pretty easy with, uh, with LIDAR data. And then you have this um, this these, this field of crops, which is, believe it or not, one of the hardest things in photogrammetry or LIDAR together is low-lying grasses and dense crops. Those are very, very, very difficult to get true, accurate ground level. There are a couple of ways that you can use post-processing to get better accuracy out of it, but it is definitely among the more difficult things to do with aerial surveying.
So accuracy, at the end of the day, it's root mean squared error. But what accuracy is not, though, that a lot of people confuse with accuracy is a couple of things. First, resolution of the imagery. A lot of people incorrectly believe that if the image is higher resolution, then the end survey is more accurate. And that is not the case. You can get a million megapixel camera, but if the GPS is bad and if the control is bad, and if the inertial measurement unit and geolocations and camera lens calibration is bad, it doesn't matter if you can read every word on a manhole, higher resolution does not necessarily mean better accuracy. Same thing, map scale is no longer equal to accuracy. That used to be the case. That used to, and a lot of surveyors still use it that way, right? Like I need a 20 scale map. I need a 40 scale map, whatever it is, with the idea that that has an implied accuracy. And that's the way that it used to be under the old national map accuracy standards. But in modern digital photogrammetry, maps and accuracy need to exist way before there's any map scale. At least in my world, I mean, we're drone data processing. We don't work with printed maps. Maps don't have a scale when we're working with them. We can zoom in and out just by scrolling the wheel. So map scale is just considered by best practices. It's no longer a good indicator of accuracy. Accuracy is not necessarily tied to map scale. Same thing with contour intervals. It's so easy for me to take a one foot contour interval and with a couple clicks, turn it into 10th of a foot contour intervals if that helps me visualize whatever I'm looking at on the project, or say, hey, this data is accurate to a tenth of a foot, but because of the elevation changes, I only want 10 foot contours visible on here. So you can have a tenth of a foot accuracy with 10 foot contour interval. So again, contour interval is no longer considered equal to accuracy, and the standards all back that up as well. So ground sampling distance, also known as resolution, map scale, or contour interval are no longer considered good ways to express uh, product accuracy. So just kind of to wrap things up, at least with the definitions of accuracy, what it is, accuracy is a measurement of the amount of error you can expect between your survey and the truth. Error is probabilistic. It's not going to be perfect. And it's not always the same across a site. And actually, there's one last little complicating factor, which is there are two components of accuracy in a drone survey. One is the error of the drone, and also this RMSA 2 that I mentioned there is the error in measuring the ground data. Believe it or not, drones have gotten so darn accurate and so good that in some cases they can be better than the GPS that you might have used to measure your ground control points. Um, that's another one where, thankfully, with surveyors, most surveyors are aware that your good GPS is good, but not perfect. I've run, run across some people, particularly those that work in either earth moving or constructions that set up their GPS and it says, oh, the, the error on this point is three thousandths of a foot because my, my trimble, it's good to three thousandths. And I hate to break it to you. No, your, your trimble GPS can absolutely not get accuracy down to three thousandths of a foot. Some people believe that. It can get accuracy, and I cover this in just a little bit, but um, typically it can get to about three, maybe four hundredths uh, horizontal and about five hundredths of a foot vertical is about what you can expect, uh, the highest quality that you can get from uh, RTK or PPK based GPS. And anything accuracy beyond about four or five hundredths of a foot uh, typically needs to be done with some sort of laser scanner or a total station or something like that. I'll pause again for a second and see if anyone else, anyone has any questions about what is accuracy. And give myself a chance to drink some water. I was going to say you had, uh, I had to unmute myself again. Uh, you had the, the surveyor's favorite slide earlier, precision and accuracy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, that's up there a lot. And yet many people still aren't, aren't aware of all, that all of those are a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, have sometimes have a hard time visualizing them too. So yeah, in correlation. Well, I mean, that it, it's so common, especially with drone surveys. You process a drone survey, you put it up, and all of your check data is off by three and a half feet in exactly the same direction. That means probably that your survey is very precise, but not accurate but, yet, yeah. and you can correct it. 
And again, shameless plug, those are the type of things that we deal with literally every day, dozens of times. It's it's very common. And in fact, that's just the nature of a lot of these workflows and just being aware of it and knowing how to correct it. That's what really matters. Good stuff. Cool. All right. So let's talk about measuring accuracy now. So like I said before, accuracy is this root mean squared error of independent check shots. Here's the actual formula. If you really, really like high school statistics uh, or the way that most people do it nowadays is in a spreadsheet or in software. No one is calculating root mean squared error. In fact, it's part of why this wasn't the standard in 1947 is because actually calculating a root mean squared error was kind of a pain in the butt before we had uh, spreadsheets. It's not that the mathematical concept wasn't there. It's that the computing power wasn't there. Um, so yeah, being able to type it into a spreadsheet or like I said, more commonly use the data that is in PIC4D or Trimble Business Center or Global Mapper or whatever it is, that's where it's processed. And when you measure your error, you want to measure the root mean squared error of independent check shots. Now, it's worth noting there's a difference between ground control points and check shots, but it's very slight. Ground control points are marked targets that you use when you're making a map. And checkpoints, independent checkpoints, are marked targets that you don't use when you're making a map. A lot of people think, oh, I need to set this many control points, this many check shots, I need to mark them differently. That's actually not true. In the field, there is no difference between ground control and check shots. It's how you treat them in processing that actually makes it different. So if you use it, mark it as a ground control point and use it as part of either the photogrammetry process or the LIDAR geolocation process, then it's a ground control point. And if you don't use it for that and only use it to measure the accuracy, then it's a check shot. That's a pretty important thing too, because I feel like uh, even Pix4D, if anyone's familiar with Pix4D, it's the most common photogrammetry software out there. When you mark your ground control points, one of the first lines on the quality report that it brings up with a big green check is the error of the ground control points. And that is not the same as the error of the check shots, even though they seem to say it. A lot of times that error will come out again. It's like three thousandths of a foot. That's the error of the ground control points measured to themselves after the error triangulation process. The independent check shots, that's actually your gold standard. So you got to make sure that those are separated a little bit. Uh, and things do get a little bit tricky, trickier when you're dealing with LIDAR, partly because uh, LIDAR makes horizontal measurements really hard because LIDAR is naturally uh, uncolorized. Any colorization that comes in LIDAR is actually applied after the fact. Typically, a drone will have a camera attached to it. And the, it's all done after the fact. So you can still do it by using colorization, using intensity, but it's just worth noting it's a little bit trickier. And now the standards, I should point out, when we are measuring accuracy, the standard, the rule of the standards is that the ground control data should be twice the target accuracy of the final product. And what that means, and here's where that kind of tenth of a foot magic number comes from, if you want a tenth of a foot accuracy on your aerial map, your ground survey data should have a target accuracy of five hundredths of a foot. Now, five hundredths of a foot, that's also not pale out of thin air. That is about the maximum precision that you can get out of GPS. And this is even according to the manufacturer's website. Don't trust me on that? Okay, let's go to the Opus website as well. Opus shows this as well, that Five hundredths of a foot is about like 14, 15 uh, millimeters or so. That's about what you can get with a um, three and a half hour Opus uh, solution. It's worth noting any sort of rapid static actually cannot even get to that level. Again, people often overstate the actual accuracy. Opus is great, but you can't do a 30 minute rapid static solution and expect it to be four hundredths of a foot accuracy. So all of this leads to ground accuracy with GPS is typically about five hundredths of a foot, which means with add in all of the other sources of error that come with the drone, and that's where that tenth of a foot typically comes from. That's about as good as you can get with GPS data. To get better than that, you need to start bringing in lasers. And yes, there are many ways to do that, but it's worth noting that 
if you're using a GPS based system, which almost all units, even I should point out LIDAR units, even aerial LIDAR units are constrained by the accuracy of the GPS that is on them and the GPS that is shooting the ground control points on the, uh, on the ground. So that's part of why I target that tenth of a foot accuracy. Now, I mentioned before, when you're measuring accuracy, to follow the standards perfectly, you report accuracy twice. You report vegetated and non-vegetated. You theoretically can break it into different characteristics as well, hardscape, natural terrain, vegetation. And it's hard because even within vegetation, boy, there are some wildly different types of vegetation that all ultimately will have different accuracy. The picture on the far right there that is deep in the woods is actually going to be pretty accurate with LIDAR. LIDAR is very good at penetrating high tree canopies like that. The two pictures on the left, one with low grasses, one with kind of a, a cut down brush pile, those are going to have way worse accuracy. Those are very, very hard for LIDAR. Um, the one on the far left in particular, almost impossible. So measuring your independent check shots, that's how you actually measure accuracy. And so the next question that I'm sure people are thinking about is, well, how many check shots do you need to measure accuracy and actually have it be reliable? Now, according to the standards, the highest level of the standards, 30 is your answer. There's a table here. If you actually look at this table, it's designed for a lot of like state scale mapping. So the lowest tier is actually a thousand square kilometers. So I don't think people are doing too many projects with a thousand square kilometers. Um, so the answer is 30 and there's some there's some statistics and science behind that it has to do with the central limit theorem but the short answer is 30 to be in compliance with the strictest level of the standards 30 each for vegetated and non-vegetated uh with a maximum of 120. now i should point out in the real world that is overkill 30 check shots on every project takes way too much time and it's not necessary for the majority of uh of projects but i'll cover that in a little bit I'll, but to jump to the conclusion there again because i don't like burying the lead our recommendation is five five check shots is good enough for almost all projects in the real world does it conform to the strictest level of standards for the highest level of certification no it does not but in the real world, that's a really good kind of Goldilocks level between being professional, being responsible, checking your work, having good data, making sure that you can detect errors, but also being conscious of the cost of the of the survey project, being conscious of the cost you're passing on to your customers, and being aware that you've got to be uh you've got to be a profitable business. You have to be able to be cost competitive if you want to keep getting jobs. And so we have found that five check shots is about that Goldilocks number there. As far as where to set them, there is no you know perfect standard of where to go, but spreading it across the terrain is a good rule of thumb. If you can set some at high elevation points, set some at low elevation points, but also acknowledge that part of the reason we use a drone survey is so you don't have to hike all over a site with the GPS unit and set control and check shots. So a lot of times, this is uh, this picture on the right is of a real site we did in the mountains of Central California, and it is brutal terrain, absolutely brutal. It's either poison oak, super dense uh, sagebrush, or sharp rocky cliffs. Like it takes, it would take two hours just to walk from one end of the site to the other without having to carry and set equipment is brutal. So acknowledging there are limitations and using good judgment, right? Set control as good as you can and make sure that you have experience to know the limitations of the check shots. This is where that kind of like talking to an expert helps too, because you can be aware of the limitations like, hey, I really need the accuracy in this low riverbed to be good, but I can't get down there to verify it. What can we do to make sure that the project is accurate? Because there are a few things you can do, ranging from setting check shots in other areas to making sure that your GPS data is really, really spot on and that you can rely on that pretty heavily. But also even when you measure accuracy matters as well. What we have on the right here, three different point clouds with different uh, 
algorithms applied to them, basically. The top one is just a raw point cloud where you can actually see there's a lot of noise. Some points are high, some points are low. The middle one, we apply a smoothing algorithm to it. And you can see it's smoother, but there's still some jagged points. There's a uh, there's a fairly large, um, whatchamacallit, where's my laser pointer thing? I think I have a laser pointer. There it is. Haha. <laughs> Uh, you can see like some points up here that are pretty high and jagged. If your check shot is near there, it's actually going to show kind of high air. And what we have here is the smooth average of these points. Now, mathematically, this one on the bottom is more accurate. In fact, it smooths out the air and it does some really cool mathematical stuff here where this is the world of statistics that I love, again, going back to the central limit theorem, this idea that you can actually get better error than any single point in a LIDAR point cloud by averaging out the um, the idiosyncratic error. And what you're left with is when someone is good at processing, when you apply the right smoothing algorithms, you can get your error much, much tighter after processing the data to some level to actually get really good data, clear out a lot of the noise that way. But as far as when you measure error, according to the standards, and this is one of those things where I don't like ASPRS because they're too academic, they're too strict. They say you only measure accuracy once at the absolute end of a project. And I don't like that idea. I like in the real world, I like the idea of measuring early and often. Academia says measure it at the end, but that way, uh, if you make changes to, if you discover error at the end, you're hosed. You have to do the whole thing from the beginning. It's super, super costly. Uh, we really recommend that you should check your accuracy briefly at every stage. Make sure that you didn't make any human mistakes, any blunders, because honestly, mistakes happen all the time in the real world. Whether you set your rod height wrong or you used the wrong vertical datum or the wrong horizontal datum, you forgot to localize for this or that, or you, had, you flew it on two different days and there's a three foot gap between the two days. Like these errors happen a lot and they're not a sign of negligence. They're a sign of this is a really, really complex thing with a lot of human steps. So we're big fans of checking data early and checking data often. And it should be uh, noted that sometimes big mistakes happen. Blunders are what they're called, where I think they, the, the standards are kind of mean on this. A mistake resulting from carelessness or negligence, not to be confused with error. And this is the idea that you set a point and it's off by five feet. Why is it off by five feet? You can't just ignore it. You have to look into it and say, oh, it's because this shot was measured in a brush pile here. And so it, the LIDAR scanner didn't penetrate it, measured the top of the LIDAR brush pile, the GPS measured the ground, something like that, so you can throw it away. But then at the end, you take the root mean squared error, and that is your, your final accuracy, and that's what you can actually report is the root mean squared error of independent check shots before, uh, relative to everything else. So that's measuring accuracy. Next up is actually going to be, now that we've measured accuracy, how do you certify it? What does it take to certify it? What does it even mean to certify accuracy? A lot of people aren't aware that they're actually that these that this document, the Precisional Accuracy Standards, actually sets up procedures for the formal certification of accuracy when you need it. But as we're getting into this, I should point out one very important thing is that certifying accuracy does not improve the accuracy. All it does is measure it. And it a full certification, your top tier proper certification, takes a lot of time and effort, both in the field and in the office. And because of this, we found that full certification is very, very rare in commercial surveys. Because for all those reasons I said before with regards to business being cost competitive, trying to save, save time and actually make sure you turn a profit, it's not worth it. And it's not worth it to go through all of this cost just to measure accuracy. And in fact, the only people that we see regularly certify accuracy is uh, the federal government. Uh, specifically, we've done some jobs with the Army Corps of Engineers where they say, I must have an ASPR accuracy certification. And then the person, the surveyor will say, okay, that's going to cost you X dollars and they'll actually pay it. 
Most private clients aren't going to be willing to pay for a full certification, and that's part of why they are typically very, very rare. Now, that doesn't mean there's no value to knowing what the certification process is. By being aware of the process, you know when you can use it, and it actually can inform a lot of other very good procedures. Now, there are three levels of certification in the uh, standards. The highest level is something called the tested to meet standard. This is where you set your 30 independent check shots and everything is measured in full compliance with the positional accuracy standards. Very accurate, but very uh, expensive as well. And then there is something in the middle called tested to meet with limited check shots. That's where you still use independent check shots to measure everything, but you're using less than the 30 that they recommend. This is what we kind of call the Goldilocks zone, I think, in many places. And if you use your five independent check shots, you can still use these procedures and certify accuracy with this more limited standard. And then there's a third standard called the Produce to Meet standard. This one's a little weird because you can do this without any check shots, but it requires a lot of experience and a lot of confidence in your system. Let's go through these in a little bit more detail. Just because this is what the uh, the certification statement looks like. And this is, again, when I say a tenth of a foot accuracy, it's because I don't want to read this whole wall of text every time I say a tenth of a foot, where it says you actually use your 30 check shots. This data set was tested to meet the ASPRS positional accuracy standards for a blank centimeter since centimeters. They don't actually say whether or not you can switch to feet like tenths or hundredths, but I always do anyway, and no one's gotten mad at me uh, yet, at least. Uh, positional accuracy class and the tested horizontal positional accuracy was found to be blank centimeters. So that is where you set your 30 check shots, and you measure it, and you report the error. That's your full standard. Now, again, you have to actually be honest that your check shots were check shots, but this is what your uh, high-level certification looks like. The limited version has a little bit more uh, information there where you explicitly state it calls for 30 check shots. However, this was performed using only blank check shots and the accuracy that we found was X. So again, it's that lower level certification. Quite frankly, most of the surveys that we do come very, very close to this level of certification, but don't print the certification statement because even that is a little bit more work than is necessary for not that much value. <coughs> Excuse me. So this using limited check shots, we really like this. And then the last one is this produce to meet standard where basically if not enough check shots are available, but the data producer uh, can prove, can guarantee that they can produce uh, reliable results and guarantee the produce to meet accuracy they may report the accuracy in this statement. So what does it mean to have demonstrated uh, your work to the point where you can guarantee accuracy? That doesn't have any clear definition. So it comes to that kind of professional level of responsibility. This one is very, very rare. If someone actually wants an accuracy statement, they're typically going to be willing to go for one of the ones where you actually measure it. Produced to meet is not as common just because it does require a, a fair amount of experience. There's a whole bunch more information in this as well, ranging from things like normality testing to make sure that the data set and the accuracy and the check shots that you measured are skewed or not skewed. You can go into the positional accuracy standards if you want. I'm not going to go into that because it's just it's way more detailed than is necessary for 99% of projects. But our recommendations overall when it comes to certifying. The tested to meet standard, it's too practical or it's too expensive and impractical for most projects. Whereas produced to meet requires that level of experience and control that it's it's rare and also pretty expensive. Whereas that tested to meet with limited check shots is a good Goldilocks method. Like I was mentioning, mentioning before, five check shots is almost always good enough, even though perfect procedural compliance following Every step of the rule in terms of how you're supposed to control the data and measure everything is often impractical. And we think flexing on some of those can be okay as long as you are professionally educated, honest, and responsive. <coughs> and honestly, that's a huge part of this, right? It's just being responsible about 
what you know and being aware of the limitations of your own knowledge. I mean, heck, that'll get you 99% of the way there by itself. Any questions on uh, measuring your certification before we then get into the even more practical side of how do you get accurate surveys? What are the things that get? Anyone? Usually it's quiet till the end. Then there'll be okay. like one or two. <laughs> no worries. Love it. Yeah, keep going. Good then stuff. let's keep going. So what impacts accuracy? How do you get an accurate aerial survey? Well, lots of things do, but there are a couple of main categories. First off, the one that everyone jumps to first is the drone and the sensor. Yes, better drone, better sensor will typically often, but not always, get you better accuracy. But part of the reason everyone focuses on the drone and sensor first is because there are survey vendors out there that are willing to sell you a drone and sensor, even though the other categories are more often than not where the issue actually lies and where you can get better accuracy. More boring things like mission planning. What are the settings on your drone? Where did you set your ground control points? What accuracy that you, uh, or what altitude did you fly at? What overlap did you fly at? What flight pattern was it? All those sorts of things are typically going to be just as important as well as ground data collection. Like I said, where did you set your ground control points? Where did you set your check shots? What tools did you use to do that? Data processing as well. Like I mentioned, that idea of how you smooth a point cloud can get you better accuracy. But likewise, what settings you use in photogrammetry, what software you use, what type of photogrammetrist you have, did you run PPK processing on the data stream from there? And even like I said, the site characteristics, how much vegetation, what type of stuff it is, every one of these impacts accuracy. And honestly, any one of them can ruin a project. One of the interesting parts about accuracy is that it is measured not by the best or strongest link in the chain. Your ac accuracy is determined by the weakest link in the chain. What I mean by that is, you could have a million dollar drone with a $300,000 photogrammetry camera, but if the GPS unit on it is terrible and the IMU is terrible and the camera's out of focus, it's gonna be off by 10 feet. It doesn't matter that you have the world's greatest drone. It's gonna be terrible because it's about the weakest link in the chain. So the way to get good accuracy is not to go through and say, oh, I'm gonna get a better drone or I'm going to get much better data. I'm going to get a more expensive computer that'll allow me to get better photogrammetry processing. It actually depends on where the weakest link in your chain is. And it's different all around there. But to go back to that kind of accuracy thing, target accuracy, according to us, right around a tenth of a foot. That's what we think you ought to be targeting um, to get there. So if you're around a tenth of a foot accuracy, then you are about on par with the, the best surveys out there. Yes, you can get better than that, but boy, every single one of these steps starts getting really, really, really expensive for every little bit beyond a tenth of a foot you want for aerial surveying, at least. Um, lens filters and Adobe Lightroom, what are your thoughts and concerns using those? Yeah, I'll actually talk about that right now because that's a great question. Thank you. Um, as a rule of thumb, I don't use any of those. Now, Lens filters and Adobe Lightroom for adjusting the images is very good at making uh, an ortho photo prettier. It's about getting the white balance levels right. It's about getting the lighting right, and it makes it look nicer. However, it doesn't add quality to the data, and or it doesn't add quality to the model in terms of the accuracy of the model, and in some cases can detract from the accuracy of the model. So as a rule of thumb, and great, I'll, I'll admit my own bias here, I come from the statistics and photogrammetry side. If you want a really pretty ortho photo, I'm not your guy. I have, I'm the statistics guy. I know how to make the numbers add up. I don't know, I am not an artist. So don't come to me with that, or at least if you do, be aware of my own limitations. It's part of why I don't use it. I, on the other hand, uh, often just embrace the fact that their lighting condition changes, right? You're flying a drone and halfway through the clouds broke and it was shady on half the site. 
and then there's this weird colored line, and then it's sunny with shadows on the other half of the site. Yeah, it looks a little bit odd, but it's fine. It's the accuracy of the data that matters. And you can mess around with the lens filters in Adobe Lightroom and like change your white balance there. And that's not gonna improve the accuracy at all. It might make it prettier, but that's not my focus. I So you can use it to improve the overall visibility, like what your ortho photo looks like, but we don't think it's necessary. Side note, are you a, photogra or, uh, a uh, photographer when it comes to like landscaping or anything like that? Since you're a numbers guy, are you any kind of photographer type stuff? Because that's one of my favorite things too, is the, a, a perfect picture is all about f-stop, ISOs, shutter speeds, yep. right? It's all about numbers. And that's why I enjoy photogrammetry as well. But that is correct. And I know about all of those things, but I can tell you, especially on the, da <laughs> the data processing side, that has seen thousands of pilots keep the settings at auto, keep the drone settings at yeah. auto. Is right. it possible? Like you're chasing that tail of like, what's the difference between uh, nine hundredths and nine and a half hundredths of a foot. <laughs> and what I have seen before though, is people trying to tweak the settings, right? Then leave the settings from a previous project and or get it wrong. And it ruins the data and makes it out of focus or completely un, like so blown out that you can't see anything. Auto settings come they they get you a level of operational reliability in that sort of thing. Yeah. Um nice. as far as white balance, can it increase the amount of ground that post-processing can model under tree coverage? Yes, getting the right lighting, white balance, uh, and exposure values for the camera can help. And that's part of why we actually recommend keeping the cameras on auto. And it's actually worth noting, white balance is not the setting that can help under trees, it's exposure value. So that how much light it is, what might seem something washed out versus like too dark. Exposure value, keeping that set to automatic so it can actually change over the course of a site can help get you uh, better data underneath either tree coverage or in shadowed areas. But in nearly all circumstances, just keeping your drone settings to auto is going to be the most reliable and best way there. So that's our recommendation at least. Nice. Perfect. As far as drone call drone quality as well, I want to talk about just a couple of different drones. These are two drones that are, I would say, are okay, not great. These are ones that are a little popular. There's the Autel Evo 2, which People are, have been buying because it's not a DJI drone and it's a little bit more affordable. And quite frankly, I also know that they give better dealer margins. So the dealers definitely are pushing this more than DJI drones. Um, we don't love it because it's got a linear roll. Both of these cameras, or the, the one on the left, the Autel, has a linear rolling shutter camera. It's got some issues syncing the GPS on top with the actual camera image center location. It's kind of a mess to process. It's okay, but it's not great. The one on the right is the DJI Phantom 4. The Phantom 4, I should point out, was the absolute workhorse for, you know, four or five years, but it's just old. It's no longer being manufactured. It's not RTK capable. Any modern survey drone, it, eight years ago, you couldn't get a good RTK survey drone. You had to rely on something like this. But nowadays, you want one with RTK, whether it's the Phantom 4 RTK, which for the record, if you have a Phantom 4 RTK, keep that drone. We love that thing. That is an absolute workhorse drone. It is boring, but the accuracy is super, super great. Unfortunately, it's discontinued as well. But our recommended aircraft for anyone who wants to know, um, our favorite right now is actually the Mavic 3 Enterprise RTK. It's about 10 grand all in. Mechanical shutter, photogrammetry drone. And honestly, it's way more capable than people think. We have seen very, very high quality surveys up to a couple hundred acres with a drone like this. The only downside is it's not LiDAR. Now, I don't think people need LiDAR on every project and LiDAR drones are way more expensive and way more of a pain in the butt to use. So if you don't need it, don't need LiDAR, don't use LiDAR. Use a photogrammetry drone and this is our favorite, just kind of basic workhorse, this is your Honda Civic. It's going to run for 250,000 miles, and it's not flashy, but boy, it'll get the job done and be reliable. If, however, you do need LiDAR, 
The DJI M350 with the new L2 LiDAR sensor, that's our favorite LiDAR system out there. That one's about $35,000, $40,000 all in. It is the easiest to use. The newest sensor has great accuracy. We love that. Um, but it's a lot bigger, more expensive, and kind of a pain in the butt to use relative to the uh, its little cousin, the Mavic 3 Enterprise RTK. This is, if you want to think about it, if the Mavic 3 is your Honda Civic, this is your Mack truck. It can do a heck of a lot more, but yeah, it's kind of a pain in the butt if you don't want to you don't want to use it on your daily commute necessarily, even though it's way more powerful. And then lastly, the Winter One. This is our favorite of the non-Chinese drones that are out there. DJI is, of course, a Chinese company. There are some people, especially if you work in uh, government-related jobs, you can't buy DJI. <coughs> it's worth noting. Yeah, if you can't purchase DJI, you're not alone. Uh, a lot of people can't. Unfortunately, DJI, they own 60, 70% of the market for commercial drones. And going outside of DJI, they're just our trade-offs. They're absolutely our trade-offs no matter what. I wish there was a non-DJI equivalent to the M350. There is a, they're going to be more expensive and way harder to use. You can get the same accuracy, but it's going to be a lot more expensive and a lot harder to use. Our favorite of the non-DJI drones is actually this Winter One. It has some things that are better. It has a higher megapixel count camera, which is not the only thing, but it's a fixed wing. It can cover a lot of land, but it's big. It's expensive. It's you know ranging from fifty to eighty thousand dollars, depending on what settings and stuff you trick it out. The accuracy is great on it. It's just kind of harder to use. This one's Swiss made. Um, so yeah, bummer that you can't purchase DJI. I I wish there were American manufacturers that made uh, drones at the same cost and quality level. And hopefully there are, some, there are plenty that are trying, but right now there's just nothing out there that, that can compete in terms of cost and quality. Does the uh, Wingtra fit on the blue list and all that? Yeah. Yep, Wintra yep. is on the blue list. It, it is the it meets uh, effectively the highest level of uh, approval necessary. Yep, perfect. perfect. And most, <laughs> I should point out, most of the drones on the blue list are very much made for military and police. Yeah, like you pull up their websites and it's guys wearing like tactical gear with uh, with AR style rifles and a drone performing reconnaissance for them, and it's like, <laughs> okay, yeah. That's that's your market. You're I, I don't care about that. Where's the RTK antenna? That's what I want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Perfect. Winker is now also LiDAR sensor, uh, says Mark. So yep, they sure do. Uh we have seen it in person, but I have not flown it myself yet, which is uh before we can fully endorse that. It's it's got some I'm I'm very intrigued by their LiDAR sensor. Is that a, a question someone raised yeah, their yeah. hand there? Yeah, yes. Justin's got his hand up. And then, Mark, you work for Caltrans, right? Is that is that correct? I don't know if you want to throw it on the chat or not, but Jesse's, Jesse's got a question. Go for it. Yep, he works for Caltrans, so go for it. Jesse? Uh, so the question, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear it. Okay. Yeah, so the question was on the uh, winter LiDAR, uh, which I have been doing some research on. Uh, have you heard anything about the LiDAR sensor? being uh accepted onto the blue list because i know that the drone is but i know that they take all sensors independently hmm. that's a great question i haven't heard that yet i know the winter guys and i can ask them but i have no doubt that they will get it added to the blue list getting the winter certified on the blue list is is pretty important i would imagine they can get it certified pretty darn quickly though mm -hmm. but maybe, maybe that's something mark knows <laughs> yeah <laughs> see if there was a little chat or not but now, <laughs> I, I will point out, though, uh, for Mark, we're going to Caltrans, at least. This is one of those other weird things with Caltrans, too. Uh, I, I'm not going to name names, but we work for a lot of surveyors who uh, are subs for Caltrans and absolutely use DJI drones on Caltrans projects all the time. I don't know. And that's honestly very common in a lot of. Oh, yeah, shh, sorry. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Wingtra, Wingtra is on the blue list, but he, uh, Jesse's question for Mark uh, was the Wingtra LiDAR sensor. Is there LiDAR sensor? That, is that on the blue list? If That'll you... be interesting because I know the, the LiDAR sensor itself is from a Chinese manufacturer. Um, but then again, even the Wingtra drone, I think like 
it it's almost impossible to get things that doesn't touch mm -hmm. some component right even if it's just the motors right the motors come from a chinese supplier that's one yeah. of the more common things so yeah, yeah, yeah. i i don't know it's a great question yeah no that's a great great question but yeah it's um it's very interesting to see uh how different people get around these regulations because again i i work for a lot of companies that are subs for i mean like i said caltrans army yeah. corps of engineers just about any DOT in the country and people will be using DJI drones as subs, but they, the actual state agencies themselves cannot buy them. Yeah. And there's some interesting stuff too that I have, boy, I could talk about the legal side of this, which I find <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> Is our DJI Phantom 4 RTK good if we paint it orange? <laughs> I won't tell, that's for sure. <laughs> And then uh, Mark I like to put a mustache on my drone and, and spectacles. That way they can't tell who it is. Very um, sweet. Spy and versus then spy stuff. Mark, Mark chimed in and said LIDAR is the same as uh, rock robotics. So maybe, maybe it isn't, but. Yeah, so maybe that'll be, that'll be good if it is. Um, cool. We'll see. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, going a little bit more with sensor quality and then I'll wrap things up. I don't want to go too long here, but uh yeah, there are a whole bunch of different things that actually matter with sensor quality. When I talk about what our favorite drones are, just be aware that, again, it's not about making the strongest point in a sensor. It's about finding the weakest link. A lot of people will say, I want to buy this camera because it has better photo or because it has more megapixels. This one's the P1 has 46 megapixels instead of 20 megapixels without worrying about, well, that's a 35 millimeter lens instead of a 24. And depending on the flight altitude, it doesn't work. So yes, resolution matters, but the shutter quality, the field of view, the lens quality, and it's the same story with LiDAR. Too many people I find buy based on a single tech spec that, oh, well, in the lab, this is calibrated to a millionth of an inch or whatever. Or this one has six returns versus this LiDAR sensor only has three returns. Or this one can do 700,000 pulses per second, and this one can do 200,000. Those numbers are usually created by the sales guys to sell LiDAR hardware, at least in my opinion. It's all about, again, just being aware of what that weakest link is. And usually, not always, but usually more expensive hardware is not what's going to get you better accuracy. It's better procedures. And that's where we get to that kind of concept of mission planning, right? Mission planning is, in our experience, the source of most errors. That means just things what altitude do you want to fly at? And I'll just go through some of these slides because I'll, I'll give uh, give everyone access to the actual slide deck later. That's no problem at all. What altitude do you fly at? Are you flying too high or are you flying too low? Believe it or not, flying too low is a problem we see a lot that makes accuracy worse in many cases, especially if you don't set enough ground control points. You have what uh, what we often refer to as, at least internally, as like the drinking straw effect. You're so close to the ground that it's like trying to survey by looking through a drinking straw. You're so close to the uh, to the uh, ground that you can't actually see a wide enough area to triangulate and calculate everything appropriately. So don't fly too low, don't fly too high. Altitude absolutely matters. Same thing with obliques. Um, without getting into all the details, 75-75 is our recommendation for photogrammetry. And 60 to 65% is actually our recommendation for LiDAR. I should point out that's actually quite a bit higher than manufacturers recommend with LiDAR by going to 65, 65. Um, that's because we think it, what we've seen in the real world is having a little bit of operational redundancy really matters, especially when you are doing sites in vegetation, giving the LiDAR sensor multiple passes where it can cover the same point multiple times, if you do 60, 65, mathematically, you're covering the same point about with three different passes, about. And that gives it three chances, three different angles from which it can penetrate the vegetation. And we found that to be operationally more redundant, especially because other real world errors happen too. Whether it's elevation changes that you weren't, that you didn't see or expect, and this makes it a little bit more uh, robust, all the way to the memory card had a bad data sector on it. And so while it was writing the LiDAR data, it skipped for a second on one flight pass. And so you don't have data for a chunk. And so you get it on the way back. 
increasing your uh, your overlap can do that. So we recommend 60 to 65 for LIDAR. We found it to be more operationally reliable, at least. There are some other mission planning things like uh, nadir versus oblique data um, as well. We Our recommendations, nadir images straight down will get you good enough accuracy in almost all survey cases. Now, there are some exceptions. For example, if you are surveying uh, the facade of a cliff for structural integrity, oblique images help. If you're doing 3D modeling, a lot of people say, oh, I want to, you know, maybe you're making a 3D model of it that someone will use in a video presentation for a client. Sure, oblique imagery will help with that. If you're modeling something that you want to put as a new level in a video game, sure, oblique imagery will help with that, but it's just, uh, it's not necessary. Rob, um, Rob has a story for that. He was a <laughs> he's actually the Grand Canyon. So we were fortunate enough to fly, fly the Grand Canyon uh, from the Skywalk and mm -hmm. uh, we were able to get waivers and everything. And Rob went out and did that work, but very similar. He, he just texted me at the same time you were talking about that. He's like, oh, something we did at the Grand Canyon? Question mark? <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, that is, yeah. If you have a, uh, if you are regularly surveying 5,000 foot cliffs, the yeah. mission planning is a little bit different, but yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and so we actually have a client that uh, that we've worked with as well to do some Grand Canyon sites. I didn't actually get to to do it, but mm. it was. I think if you look at it top down from a map, it looks like a you know 10, 15 acre parcel that they were going to be putting in a water pipeline. And it's like, wow, yeah. that's going to be super easy. That's no problem. And then you look at it in profile, and there was five thousand five hundred feet of elevation change over that 10 acres and it's like oh this is going to be a real a real tricky one to do yeah they're actually uh so i side note is like the rim to rim they're replacing a lot of the wire water line in that rim to rim hike right now so um uh, may or may not have been associated yep. with that but yeah <laughs> just got a question about what targets to use for lidar that is a great question and i can tell you um, we don't use retro reflective targets or anything like that with aerial LIDAR. The key thing with that is contrast. So, um, you know, Trent actually point them out there, but I will yeah. do, let me see yeah, if I in can. in the store, I can grab it again. I was going to, there's the store on our, on our website, at least. Yeah. Uh, we actually sell two different types of ground control points. You don't have to buy ours. Thank you for those, Trent. But, yeah, uh, no, of course, um, or we sell their biodegradable ground control points so that you set them and they just turn into mush after a couple of months. But basically we sell two colors, one that is targeted more towards photogrammetry, which is going to be um, the pink and green ones because the colors are so bright, you can practically see them from space. And the other one is pink and black, which is very, very, very high contrast. And it can be picked up very well in the intensity uh, view of LIDAR scans. So those were actually designed by our photogrammetrists and LIDAR techs when we first started making them. We just sent them to our, our clients because they had such terrible ground control points and we want, our photogrammetrists wanted it to be easier to see Mark's target. So those we found are a, a very good balance between ease of use, cost, and uh, reflectivity. Now, I should point out, like many things, are they the best in the world? Well, it depends on what your view is. Like if you set a six foot by six foot target, it will be more visible than our targets, which are, uh, they're, I think they're 16 inches or 18 inches square, about that. Um, so bigger ones could be better, but they're a bit more of a pain. What if you use larger vinyl targets? Sure, but they're vinyl, they're not reused. There are trade-offs with all of these things. So much of it comes down to personal preference. We, at least on the data side, really like having very bright colors, but with LIDAR in particular, what matters is that uh, that contrast. Um, and I should point out part of the reason we like black and pink, those ones at least, they're matte colors and they are high contrast even with LIDAR, whereas even if it, if it looks black and white sometimes, that doesn't necessarily always work for LIDAR if they are both equally reflected. If it's a shiny black and a shiny white, to the LiDAR sensor, they might be both equally shiny and then you can't actually see the target. So that's why we like matte colors uh, that have 
um, one with a very low reflectivity. So the black will have very low reflectivity and the bright pink will have a little bit, have quite a bit higher reflectivity. Works well with LiDAR, but yeah, we don't use retro reflectors at least for, um, for aerial LiDAR or anything. And for those that are jumping on the uh, Aerotasa's store, the, you would select from the color. There's the pink and green and the pink and black. So it's yep. just uh, selecting from the color and then, of course, selecting the number. Uh, Let's see. The number, of pack, the number of pack of 200, 100, 200, or 500. So yep. there you go. Yep. Oh, yeah, you're going to the store right now. OK, cool. Uh, I was trying. But yes, you can go ahead and order order those online. Yep. It's loading slow because apparently if, well, I don't know if everyone's clicking on it. <laughs> yeah, no, you're good. So there is an option to collect the uh, the pink and green or the pink and black right from uh, from Logan's store. So, Yep. All right. I'll wrap things up here for now and just open it up for general questions as well. Um, and like I said, I'll send the deck. There are a handful more slides of just kind of some basic light art or basic accuracy tips and tricks. But to just kind of wrap things up on the end of this with uh, with regards to the accuracy side of things, like I said, there's there's a real big difference between, um, oh, have you tested the sturdiness of your targets in the Pacific <laughs> Northwest? Heck yeah, we have. Lots of people use them. And the, ar arguably, they're even better in the Pacific Northwest because once it rains, they biodegrade even faster. <laughs> um I should point out, yeah, they're, they're made of cardstock, the ones that we use at least. It's basically like, think of a very thin cardboard. Um, if it's not windy, you can hold it down with one nail. If it's windy and nasty, put some rocks or something on the corner and they're good enough. They're designed to be disposable single time use, at least for ours. So do people use them in the Pacific Northwest? Oh yeah, all the time. I can tell you that we, we ship a a fair amount to uh, to Washington and or Washington and Oregon and Idaho and actually all over the world or all over the country. Um, but yeah, in regards to academia versus the real world, academia is often about getting things perfect when we talk about accuracy. A lot of people, when they're talking about accuracy or really anything drone related, if you get to the academic side, people want to get things perfect, but in business, you're often faced with more limitations. No one here has infinite budget, infinite resources, infinite compute, and infinite time until they're deliverable. We have to make trade-offs. So in the real world, we often have to balance cost and time versus good enough. And that's absolutely true with accuracy as too, with accuracy as well. And unlike the documentation, I'm a student of the real world, and I think business has to be practical, economical, and commercially viable. That means you can't always certify accuracy. You can't always, and in fact, don't always want the uh, the best accuracy in the whole world because the best accuracy in the whole world is really expensive. It takes way more expensive hardware. This drone, by the way, in the top right corner here, is that is a $500,000 drone. I can tell you, we've seen the data from it. It produces super high quality data but no one uses it because it's the size of like a mini Cooper, this damn thing. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and it's $500,000. Like it's not a practical drone, but that's also about what it takes to get the best accuracy out there. So in, in our experience, you rarely need better than a 10th of a foot accuracy on aerial surveys. And if you do need better than a 10th of a foot accuracy, aerial surveying is probably not cost effective break out your total station, that's going to be a better way to do the parts, the parts that need better accuracy. And a good survey often blends it, uh, blends all of these things. We've regularly done surveys that do a mix of super high precision and very low precision. For example, a rail yard. We did a rail yard not too long ago, and the client asked us, it's like, these rail ties need to be tight. I say, how tight? And they say, like, uh, 15 thousandths of a foot. Like, yeah, not going to happen with the drone. Like, but we need topo too. How good does the topo need to be? Half a foot, no problem. So they flew the drone, half foot topo over the whole thing and broke out their total station to get the actual railroad ties themselves. And that's what a good survey should look like. Mm. So yeah, start with your uh, desired results. Be aware that certifying accuracy is expensive. In fact, on here, there are some of the crazy parts of the standard of the standards as well. 
they recommend when you're setting check shots, you should have 180 second, a three minute GPS occupation time, and you should have three occupations per check shot with reinitializing your GPS every time just to make sure that it's accurate. That takes up to nine hours just of occupation time to follow the ultimate level of this uh, this certification. That's overkill. No one does any of that. So we think five total points is almost always enough to discover errors. I should point five as long as you're using RTK, but most modern drones, you really if you're not using RTK, now is the time to upgrade. Uh, if you are using any RTK drone, whether it's a Phantom 4 RTK or anything like that, keep using it. Those ones are great. But really, basically all photogrammetry drones nowadays for, for surveying, yes, you can still limp along and still use some of the older tech, but boy, having an RTK is just so much better for accuracy, operational reliability, and it doesn't break the budget anymore. There is such a thing as too much data. And I mean, again, we think the purpose of all of this stuff should be saving time, saving money, and getting you better deliverables. So if your drone program isn't doing that, we think it should be, and it can. Um, so you should always be aware of your accuracy there. And lastly, if Trent will, Trent will allow my uh, you know 30 second pitch, this is what we do as, all day, every day. We're a data processing firm. If you process drone, if you fly drone data and want to see what people like us can get out of it, feel free to let us know, and we would be happy to process a project for anyone on this call free of charge. You can shoot me an email at an email. My email address is right there. Scan the QR code if you want, but we would be more than happy to process a free project for anyone just to see what our data is like. Granted, of course, we want to turn you into a client. That's what we wanted. That's what our end goal is with all of this stuff as well. Because that's what that's what our business is. We are a team of photogrammetrists, LIDAR technicians, CAD technicians, and drafters that put all of this together every day. So that's what we do. But that's all I add there, Trent. <laughs> oh, I love it. And of course, the best part, right? ASPRS standards. So ah, correct. A the, copy the, of that. Although yeah. you undercut me, you already sent it out in the chat. Well, you hook. know, so what I did is I <laughs> I, uh, I threw out the one that you had at the West Fed, um, but uh, and I typically will throw those in kind of a Dropbox. But yeah, for those definitely interested, um, one is even uh, as checks, right? Let's see how how well your data is and how well you're doing and that kind of stuff, right? Like. I'm, I'm like you said at the beginning, how much bad data have you really seen? It's almost it's almost like a caddy at a, a country club. How much bad golf has he ever seen, right? How much oh uh, how God. much bad data has Logan ever seen and his team ever so seen? Much. So, uh, so much. So uh, much. It behooves of you to, I guess, even uh, check your own check your own data uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff. And so it. Uh, Great presentation. I will tell you uh, as a direct message, um, someone who doesn't do anything, and this is the best compliment you can get as a as a uh, presenter, um, that someone has nothing to do with drones, but has kept my attention the entire time, which is why <laughs> I love you. And I've yeah, loved interacting with you. You're full of high energy and uh, and being being able to. It's, it's uh, important to to get a big cup of uh, to get a shot of espresso right before uh, right, right before you present. That certainly helps. That is awesome. <laughs> I love that. Um, it uh, there's so much into this, and like we said, uh, from week seven uh, when you first came on with us at Mentoring Mondays to to week one thirty two, how much has has changed. Um, the RTK, um, so the, Ma the the Mavic 3 Enterprise RTK seems to yeah. be bread and butter for probably most survey companies and the most yep. economic survey companies um, to the bigger firms with the wing trus, right? And so uh, there's, yeah. you, you, you provided three different options. And so uh, I would imagine most smaller survey firms will uh, probably look into that Mavic. I will sell you us at Diamondback and, and Rob and some of the stuff that we've all done is all with Mavic 2's non, non RTK. Oh, you got to upgrade. See, so I know no RTK and a rolling shutter, especially yeah. on larger sites. Those, yeah. those ones get real dicey. What do you, okay. So going with that, um, what's the biggest site for a Mavic 3 RTK? 
we've done a thousand acres. Holy moly. <laughs> There you go. Yep. That's awesome. And beyond that, it's a cost thing. Yeah. <laughs> where oh, like course, you're you're bumping course. up again, like just do buy yeah. do an aerial is right. Yeah, hire exactly. Airplane. Just hire an aerial firm at that point. Yeah. No, I yep. love that. Um great stuff. So anyone is more than welcome to uh unmute. I think I saw oh Jesse, Jesse's got a hand up. Go for it, sir. Oh yeah, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna grill you now. Hell yeah. Great sight. No, it took you multiple days, multiple data sets. When processing, uh, how many chunks did you guys have it? And what was your uh, processing workflow to get yeah. all of that data done? Because you know, which you site? Like, for, did you have a specific site you had in mind, or? No, you just said you did a thousand acres. Because oh. I mean, I got, oh, yeah. I do anywhere from thirty to hundred acre sites all the time up here. And I yep. constantly chunking mine out, um, but of course, I'm flying everything. Because it's so overgrown at uh, oblique, uh, mm -hmm. double pass oblique. So I'm getting thousands and thousands of photos that I'm trying to process as best as I can to try and get a ground surface. So yep. uh, what is your workflow that you're getting done to do a thousand acre site? Great. My great hundred question. acre workflow is killing me. Yeah. Uh, first of all, that's a great question for mission planning as well. Yeah. I, I, because if you have too many photos, there likely is a way that you can cut the number of photos down and still get the same quality data. So my first comment would be mission planning. That said, do we chunk sites up? Absolutely. The practical limit is about three to 5,000 photos per chunk. Now, how we chunk it up, this is where admittedly the experience of the photogrammetrist really matters because it depends on where the different days are, where the GPS control points set, when did they move a base station relative from one project site to another? Is there enough data to PPK process it against a, a permanent base station? Like, where's there a core station within 10 miles that we can use to, to post-process it to get the different days to line up really well intrinsically? And then once we get all of those chunks in line, we throw them to our photogrammetry farm where they will process in parallel. So typically, usually we try and break things up around two to 3,000 photos per chunk. We can push it up to about five. Anything beyond five becomes 5,000 photos per chunk. That is becomes pretty impractical just from a compute standpoint. It takes way too much time, way too much resources, and it's easier to break it up and, and spread it across multiple PCs. So do we chunk it up? Absolutely. Uh, but I would encourage you to look at flight ops. And you already mentioned the double, the double pass uh, photogrammetry. Depending on your level of overlap, that is almost always going to be more data than you need for the accurate results. Now, granted, you know your projects more than I do. You've probably tested out the single flight overpass, so that maybe you know them like better than me. But in almost all circumstances, double over, double, um, what do you call it? Uh, we call them cross ash patterns. So double cross ash, double grid. I mean, double yeah, grid. Double grid. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm usually running about an eighty percent overlap, eighty eighty. Uh, just eighty eighty double grid is it's so, it's extremely high, but so high. <laughs> but when we're, when you're working from basically the Cascade Range out to the ocean, uh, it's not only do we have high density up top, we have high density below. So I'm doing everything that I possibly can in a photogrammetric world to generate some sort of model that I should be using LiDAR on, but I can't afford it. And I was going to say, this is one of those <laughs> things. You're you're burning so much cost in terms of time in with processing and all of that. And yeah. yeah, that's it sounds like that's a site for LiDAR too. It's, because it's I would still, have to it's still cheaper than putting guys out there though. Yeah, oh yeah, still cheaper than putting guys out there. So that's Light solution one would be lidar if you can afford it, and solution two would be I, I would take a look at your um at the overlap, but also the other thing that is uh weird with doing photogrammetry in vegetated areas, and this is pretty counterintuitive, but you actually get better accuracy by flying higher much much of the time. So if it's heavily vegetated, peg that to four hundred feet or uh you know, maybe with a wink and a nod and not telling anyone, push it up to five or 600 feet. Um, 
but you can actually in highly vegetated areas get better modeling, better accuracy, and less data at 400 feet altitude. So I, I would encourage you giving that a try. All right, I'll give that a try on one of my next ones. Yeah, I was say, and, that, sound, that sounds like an oxymoron right there. It totally is, but it's one <laughs> of those circumstances where it works. I would encourage you do uh, on your, the next time you do a hundred acre site, do a single flight at 400 feet, 75, 75 overlap. That should take about two flight batteries. So maybe about yeah. 40 minutes or so. And that'll collect you, depending on the drone, somewhere between 700 and 1,000 photos. That's I'm, hell of a lot easier to process. Uh, Jesse, Jess, uh, good Lord. Jesse, what are you, uh, what are you flying? Uh, I fly the N3E until okay, I yep. can. Okay. I, I do actually have a quote from Frontier for the yeah. uh, 300 with the L2. Right. And they're, they're selling to me for like 30, 36 or something like that. Yeah. Yep. That's MSRP. That's that's standard for the the whole the whole kit and caboodle with the uh, M350 with the L2. Nice, nice. Uh, Nolan asks, uh, by the way, Pix4D Matic or Mapper or what's yeah. your typical workflow? Yeah, uh, we actually still like Mapper right now. Matic is faster and easier to use, but our photogrammetrists really, really, really love getting into the weeds of camera calibration and doing our own custom PPK software and changing up the image geolocations and making settings and shift block changes depending on where base stations are used. So Pix4D Mapper is still more powerful with more control. Pix4D Matic is where all of the development resources are going. It's getting very close. Um, We've actually been partners with Pix4D for a while. We've actually been helping them on the development of Matic for the last two years. It's come a long way and it's close. It's getting really, really close to being feature complete with Pix4D Mapper, but it's not there yet. So right now, it, right now we have licenses to both and we use Pix4D Mapper in probably 90 plus percent of photogrammetry cases. Wow. All kinds of shock and awe tonight. I love yeah. it. <laughs> uh, not Agisoft. Uh, that's a great question. In the same way that uh, a lot of people avoid DJI for geopolitical risk, <laughs> Agisoft is a Russian company. Um, <laughs> and Pix4D is a Swiss company. And all else equal, I will be buying my software from a Swiss company. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Agisoft is a, is a little bit cheaper, harder to use, but especially with geopolitical stuff. I mean, there was a while where people were concerned, like, wow, they're going to get sanctioned. We're not going to be able to do this whatsoever. And it's like, yeah, that's that's a real risk. Didn't realize we're getting into politics tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so who wants to talk about Chinese supply chain issues now? <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. I love it. It, it. It's the thing. I don't like delving into politics, but you can't avoid it. We work. I get it. I get it's, it. <laughs> When there are, you know, people commenting in the chat, I'm not allowed to buy this drone because of political yeah, issues. Absolutely. Boy, as a businessman, I wish I could ignore that, but that's not the way the world works. Then I love it. St sticking our head in the sand isn't the right way to do it either. So oh, this is awesome. I love this. Who else? <laughs> Come on, let's keep going. <laughs> Somebody's got to unmute themselves. <laughs> Mark. You got to have some more from Caltrans aspect. Come on. Nolan, Nolan's a, oh, oh, here we go. Oh, Jesse's got more. What do you got? Oh, <laughs> NSRS 2025. You know now we're getting deep. All day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will be honest with this. I do not know enough about NSRS 25 and how it will affect, uh, I, I can't give a good answer to that yet it's something that i should probably look into well because you're assuming it's coming out in 2025 and it's not <laughs> that's why i put the asterisk <laughs> it's gonna be more like 20 it was supposed to be 2022 and we just keep <laughs> kicking it down the road so <laughs> logan you have a few more years to learn more about this one so you oh boy i have a lot more to learn the entire well, time that's kind of the joy of this too right this is a hurry up because we started it up here in oregon <laughs> of course you did <laughs> thanks matthew this is awesome 
<laughs> ah, I love these conversations. Anybody else? Come on. If not, Logan's got dinner to make. So <laughs> that's true. I got my my little ones at home. It'll be uh be happy if I can get home a couple minutes early too. Anyway, that's right. Uh, I love it. Uh, oh, twenty twenty eight. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've got a while. Yeah, plus or minus. We got a couple of years. We actually uh last week it was week one thirty one, so it was been two weeks ago. But uh, we had Jacob Heck on, and he talked about the some of the some of the data references that are associated with that twenty twenty two datum, and that's where we talked about twenty twenty seven possibly, but twenty twenty eight. It's it's a is a rolling number at this point. <laughs> yeah. I I will say from my from what I do know. Now again, I am not an expert on the new data sure. and everything, but yeah, no. generally speaking, I don't expect it to impact the final accuracy of drone surveys very much at all because they're the limitations of drone survey accuracy aren't really related to the data. They're related to the the literal GPS hardware right. that is on orbit on the satellites. And that's not what's going to be updated. It's related to the noise and error and photogrammetry, and that's not what's being updated. Um, or the boots on the ground, right? So. Or the boots on the ground. So I would not expect it to have any material impact on accuracy, would be my my guess. But again, I, I don't say that with nearly as much confidence as some of the other things that I, yeah. uh, that I dive a lot deeper into. <laughs> no, this was awesome. Anybody else? Uh, so much, so much good stuff. I love it. Um, obviously, you can uh, scan the QR code and, and uh, reach oh. out to Logan and uh, mm -hmm. get all the information you need. I do have a couple of Dropbox files. Um, check out Aerotoss's website. Check out Aerotoss's store. Um, there you go. Mark's, Mark says thank you, like everybody else in the chat. So another amazing presentation by Mr. Logan. And uh, again, thank you for all the support for surveyors and trying. Surveyors are very slow at adapting uh, to technology. And so hopefully this is just another step for them to uh, to provide some more information and, and help to uh, make the leap. And even if they fly it themselves and have you process it, that's even uh, probably a better situation when you have somebody uh, with the ASPRS standards uh, certification behind you uh, means that they're getting a, a certified product to their client. And so um, fly it and send it to Logan, and you're going to probably have the best combination uh, that you can probably get for your client. So amazing, Thanks, Logan, Logan, as always. <laughs> uh, look forward to uh, seeing you at the next conference somewhere. If not, uh, I'm sure you have a ton of canned presentations, so hopefully we'll get some maybe, maybe some more over the summer or maybe uh, over the fall. So I'm with well, you. As always. <laughs> so All thank right. you, sir. Awesome. Thank, thank you, Trent. Wonderful for putting it on. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Have a good week, everybody. All Bye, right. guys. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks, Logan.